Hey everyone, so here we're going to talk about the ideas of chemical bonds. We've talked about how atoms are formed by the interaction between the nucleus and electrons in the previous set of videos. Here we're going to try to answer questions like why do certain compounds form and why do they have the properties they do? So for example, why is table salt very brittle and hard, easy to break, whereas things like candle wax is low melting, soft, and non-conducting, and that's what chemical bonds bonds help to answer. We have about a hundred some elements in the periodic table, but the number of molecules and compounds in the universe is way, way more than that. So that tells you that there's some preference to form molecules and compounds, and we have to understand why. Now, just like in anything in chemistry, the reason a process takes place is because the energy of that system that's formed is lower than the energy of the system before it was formed. When we have separated ions like this, they are less stable compared to when they form an ionic compound. Now it's just a matter of figuring out what the positive and the negative species are that differentiate between the different types of bonds. So the first is metal and non-metal. There's a big difference in their ability to lose and gain electrons. You may recall from previous chapter where we talked about quantum mechanics that metals tend to have very low ionization energy meaning that it's easy for them to lose electrons. On the other hand non-metals have very excellent thermic electron affinity, which means that nonmetals like to accept electron. So when metals and nonmetals are together, the metals tend to form cations and the nonmetals tend to form anions. Now once those ions are formed, we have very strong electrostatic attraction between the cations and the anions, which then forms the ionic compound. And so that interaction between the cations and anions is what we call an ionic bond. Let's take a look at the second type of bond, and that is a bonding between non-metal and non-metal. Both of them don't like to give away their electrons because they have high ionization energy, but they like to pull electrons to themselves. The best arrangement is to share those valence electrons and then we have a type of bonding that we call covalent bonding. The third type of bonding is bonding when we have two metallic elements. And now you have two elements that like to give away their electrons, right? They have very low ionization energy. So since these valence electrons are all sent out, out to the outer area of the metallic atoms which now form cations and that's how the interactions are maintained. We'll focus mostly on the first two types of bonds. So let's take a look in more detail about ionic bonds. How many electrons is each element going to give away or to accept? That really depends on its electron configuration and as you may recall the noble gas electron configuration is the most stable one so typically what these elements try to do is to either lose or gain as many electrons as they need to until they mimic the electron configuration of a noble gas. Here's an example with calcium. You can write the electron configuration of calcium as argon 4s2. So if calcium were to lose those two 4s electrons, then it would have the same electron configuration as argon. Oxygen has an atomic number of 8, so its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p4. Closest noble gas here to oxygen would be neon, which has the following electron configuration. So that requires two additional electrons to be gained by oxygen, calcium give away its two electrons, then if oxygen is nearby, then oxygen will gain the two electrons, resulting in a calcium 2 plus ion and an oxide ion, which is O2 minus. And once those two form, then they can have the strong electrostatic attraction that results in the ionic bond. An ionic bond is actually composed of many, many bonds that are made by ions that are structured like a lattice. So a lattice is just a regular arrangement of pattern. If you think about a pattern on um, wallpaper that repeats again and again, that's what a lattice is. And ionic solid is just a three-dimensional lattice pattern. You have cation, anion, cation, anion, just repeating in three dimensions. For each cation and anion, there is a bond, but that bond is repeated throughout the entire lattice. It's not correct to say one ionic bond because it doesn't really exist, but a lot of times to help us with calculation, we like to refer to just one unit of an ionic compound, so just the NaCl as opposed to a repeating pattern of Na and Cl. So we call that one unit the formula unit. The actual structure of NaCl looks like this. The strength of ionic bond is quantified using lattice energy. How much energy is holding this lattice together? And lattice energy is measured by combining oppositely charged gaseous ions to form an ionic solid. So the reaction generally would look something like this. You will take your cation in the gas state plus your anion in the gas state, combining them to form your ionic compound into solid 
solid state. The energy in this case is going to be negative because you're going from separated ions into a combined compound where this is a lot more stable or lower in energy compared to that. So that's going to be a very exothermic process. One way we can quantify this is just by comparing the type of ions that are involved and the distance that separates the two ions. The basis of this lattice energy interaction is electrostatic interaction. So we can estimate it using Coulomb's law, which is just the law that measures the strength of electrostatic interaction. So lattice energy is proportional to Q1 times Q2 over R, where Q1 and Q2 here represent the charges of the cation and the anion. And then R represents the distance between the two ions. Your lattice energy is proportional to Q1, Q2. So the larger those charges are, the stronger the attraction would be. And it's inversely proportional to R, which means that the larger the distance that separates the two ions, the weaker the interaction will be. And it's going to be used to compare the relative strength of two different ionic compounds. It's important to remember that for R, we need to look back at the concept of ionic radii that you learn in the quantum mechanics chapter, that all the cations become smaller when they form the ion from the atoms. And then for the anions, they become larger. And of course, we have the concept of isoelectronic ions, which are ions with the same number of electrons. And for those specific type of series, it's fairly easy to predict the relative sizes of those ions. So let's take a look at this problem. In the first example, we have the comparison of the lattice energy between sodium fluoride and magnesium chloride. The goal here is really to see which lattice energy is going to be more exothermic. The lattice energy is proportional to the charges of each of the ions divided by the distance between those two ions. So here what I've done is separate out the cation and anion of each compound and then analyzing what the two factors are. Now Q1, Q2 are in the numerator, so the larger those are, the more exothermic the lattice energy is going to be. Sodium is plus one, chloride is minus one, so multiplying those two gives you negative one, whereas magnesium is plus two, chloride is minus one, so multiplying those two gives you minus two. Sometimes students get a little confused whether they have to multiply two chloride because the formula is MgCl2. If you recall, the structure of an ionic compound is not just one unit like what we write here in a formula, but it's actually a bunch of repeating ions. So what we're really interested in is the interaction between one Mg and one Cl. Then we look at R. To do that, we're going to need to look at relative ionic radii. And so here I have a periodic table just as a reference to help determine the location of these ions. Sodium and magnesium both have 10 electrons, so they're isoelectronic series, but sodium has fewer protons compared to magnesium. So that means the magnesium ion is going to be smaller because the 12 protons can more effectively attract the 10 electrons in its orbitals. Chloride has 10 electrons and protons, and chloride has 17 and 18, respectively, for protons and electrons. So because chloride has 18 electrons, that means the valence electron sits in the third shell, whereas fluoride is in the second shell. So fluoride is going to be bigger. If you compare these two information that we just got about distances, we don't really have a clear conclusion from the radius or the size factor because the two things counteract each other. So R doesn't seem to be a huge factor in this case, but it's clear that in terms of the charges that magnesium chloride is much stronger than sodium fluoride. So we would conclude magnesium chloride will have a higher or more exothermic lattice energy compared to sodium fluoride. Let's take a look at a second example. So again, we're going to look at each of the factors. Magnesium compared to calcium as cations, they both have a charge of plus two. Fluoride and bromide both have a charge of negative one. So the Q1, Q2 actually are identical. We'll take a look now at the sizes, and we don't need to know actual sizes, but just relative sizes. Calcium has 18 electrons, magnesium has 10 electrons, so calcium is going to be bigger because it's in third shell versus magnesium in second shell. Fluoride and bromide, again, we have 36 for one, 18 for the other. So fourth shell for bromide and third shell for chloride, so bromide is going to be bigger than chloride. So in both cases, the calcium bromide species are larger than the magnesium chloride species. So if you draw this magnesium chloride would look like this, which gives you that distance between the two nuclei of the ions. And then calcium bromide, on the other hand, would be the one at the bottom will result in this R for that compound. So as you can see here, the R for calcium bromide is going to be larger than the R for magnesium chloride. The larger the value of R, the weaker lattice energy is going to be. We would conclude that magnesium chloride has a stronger lattice energy or more exothermic lattice energy.
compared to calcium bromide. There is a much more precise way to calculate the strength of an ionic bond. We use a thermodynamic cycle or Hess's law approach of combining a specific set of reactions so that when we add those reactions together, it will allow us to calculate our lattice energy. This particular thermodynamic cycle is the Born-Haber cycle. This is an overview of that cycle. You're going to start with your elements in their original natural form. So metals tend to be solids and then non-metals tend to be gases. We need to separate them into their atoms. So we're going to need to break apart the metals. That usually means taking them from a solid state to a gas state. So we're going to need to know what the energy is for that process, which is a sublimation process. We also need to take our non-metals from the diatomic form or whatever greater form into the monoatomic form. So that means we need to break that covalent bond apart. And to do that, the energy is called the bond dissociation enthalpy value of that non-metal. Then we need to make them into ions. So the metal needs to be made into a cation. The non-metals need to be made into anion. For the cation formation, that means we need to know the energy needed for ionization. For the anion formation, we're going to need to know electron affinity for that specific non-metal. Now, once they form ions, they can then combine together to form the ionic compound. And that, of course, is the lattice energy value. We need to figure out what that number is. Now, notice that if you take the reverse process here, going from these guys, the naturally occurring forms of the metals, non-metals, and then you form the ionic crystal, that value is actually the same as your enthalpy of formation that you learned in thermochemistry. So what we're saying here is that this whole process is a cycle. And if you know three of these things, you can figure out the fourth one. So we're going to use formation enthalpy, this step here, which includes these two separate enthalpies, this step here, which includes these two separate enthalpies, we're going to be able to figure out what the lattice energy is. So let me work this out with lithium fluoride as an example. So starting with first the lithium and the fluorine in their naturally occurring state. Lithium is originally a solid and in order for it to be made into separated atoms, we have to convert them into to gases. So that's called the sublimation enthalpy. And this is an endothermic process, right? You're trying to separate the solids, which are all packed together into their gas states where they're separated apart. That's 161 kilojoules. The fluorine molecules initially exist as gases, but it's bonded together. And what we want is the atoms of fluorine, not the molecules of fluorine. So we have to take that and break it apart. We can look up the value for the bond dissociation for fluorine, which ends up being 77 kilojoules for this reaction. Following this idea, we're going to take all those atoms and then convert them to the respective ions. So the lithium atom is going to be converted into lithium ion. That means it has to lose an electron. So the measure of that energy is first ionization energy for lithium, which is also an endothermic process, 520. For fluorine, you need to now add electron to it to make it an anion. So that's an electron affinity energy that you need to look up. That number is negative 328 kilojoules exothermic process. Once you have those numbers, then the next process is we're going to add the lattice energy and the sum of that should equal the enthalpy of formation. And so that's what we're doing right here. We look at the enthalpy of formation of lithium fluoride from Li solid and fluorine gas. Let's take those four steps that we had earlier, right? The sublimation, the dissociation, first ionization energy, and the electron affinity. Then we have to add some number that corresponds corresponds to the lattice energy so that we ended up getting negative 617. And the number that would balance that out will be negative 1,008 kilojoules. That is the lattice energy for lithium fluoride. Okay. So let's take a look at an example on how to actually calculate the lattice energy of an ionic compound using the Born-Haber cycle. The overall process of calculating the lattice energy depends on understanding that you are going to need to take your metal from whatever its original state is into a cation in the gas state. And similarly, you're going to take your non-metal from whatever the original state you're finding it into an anion in the gas state, and then take the cation and anion both in the gas state to form an ionic compound in the solid state. And the addition of all those three steps would result in the formation reaction equation for that specific ionic compound. So let me break that down here with the magnesium fluoride formation. So we have the following reactions already given to us. And typically in, in lattice energy questions, you would have a set of reactions given to you. So when I start
start with the first step there, which is to take my metal from the original state into a cation, the gas phase, I'm going to have to look at all the reactions that involve magnesium. So I have a reaction where magnesium goes from solid to gas, which is called a sublimation reaction. Right, so I wrote it down there next to the reaction itself. Sometimes you might be given the reaction. Sometimes you might be told that the sublimation enthalpy for magnesium is 148 kilojoules, in which case you have to understand that that refers to a solid to gas conversion. Now we need to take that magnesium that's already in the gas phase into its ion form. You're going to have to do it two steps because magnesium fluoride is magnesium in a plus two state. These processes where we remove electrons, which is an ionization energy step, you can only do it one at a time. So one, the 738 correspond to the first ionization energy, and then the 1450 corresponds to the second ionization energy. So these first three corresponds to all the steps for the metal to take it from its natural state of magnesium solid into its gas state for the cation. For the nonmetal, the fluoride originally comes in the form of fluorine gas. So fluorine gas first has to be converted into fluorine atoms because you have a diatomic molecule at the beginning. And that is a bond dissociation energy. So as you can see here, I wrote it down 159. So you need to add energy to break the bond. And then you need to convert that atom into a negative ion. So that's a electron affinity reaction. F plus electrons going to fluoride. Typically exothermic, especially for these non-metal elements, because they can afford to get that additional electron due to the smaller sizes, closer to nucleus. So we got negative 328. Notice though that if I just do that standard reaction that's written there, that's not going to allow me to cancel out the fluorine because I have two fluorine coming from the top right here. So as a result, I multiply this equation by two, resulting in multiplying the enthalpy by two, giving me negative 656. So just keep that in mind that there's certain things you need to do to adjust that equation so that you can cancel it out in the Hess's Law method. And the last reaction is your lattice reaction, right? So going back here to the original approach, remember that the lattice reaction is just the reaction where you take the cation and ion, converting it to the ionic compound. And that's the one that we want to know. So at the beginning, if we just write that out, Mg2 plus plus 2F minus goes to MgF2, I don't know what the enthalpy of that is, but the whole point is that I'm going to have the enthalpy of all the other reactions. And then the summation of all of these reactions should give me the enthalpy of formation reaction at the bottom, which I'm also given in that question. So that last part right there is the enthalpy of formation, which is negative 1123. So now this is where you can actually cancel things out to make sure that you're writing everything correctly. So your magnesium gas is going to cancel. Your magnesium plus here is also in the gas phase. So that's also going to cancel. Your two fluorine in the gas phase is going to cancel with this two fluorine here. You have two electrons coming from the ionization reactions. That's going to cancel with the electron affinity, two electrons. And then as you see, when you write that lattice energy reaction correctly, it should cancel out with the remaining species. So the two fluoride cancel out with this, and then the magnesium ion will cancel out here as well. So here's what you have at the end. I have magnesium solid, fluorine gas, F2, and then I should have MgF2 solid. So when you add those two together, that is the formation reaction for magnesium fluoride, right? Which is magnesium and fluorine, their standard states forming that ionic compound. So if you were to do the addition of these numbers right here, and then of course, this is the one that's multiplied by two. And then you have one number here that you're not sure about, right? This is the one you're trying to solve. I was a blank earlier. All those numbers have to add up to equal the enthalpy of formation, which is the number at the bottom, the negative 1123. So then the number would be negative 2962. And you can just calculate that by subtracting, right? This minus all of these guys right here and that one. Okay, so that's how you can get your lattice energy. Now, again, I want to emphasize that sometimes what people want to do is just come up with some formula where they say, okay, I'm always going to take the formation enthalpy and subtract all the other numbers. That's not always going to be correct because as you notice here, you know, for the electron affinity energy, which is this one right here, we have to multiply it by two before we do the subtraction. It all depends on the, the type of compounds you're dealing with. Sometimes you might have to multiply by two. Sometimes it might be a different number that you have to multiply by. So just keep that in mind that it's not just a formula of subtracting formation enthalpy from all the other steps.